welcome to another addictive episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast with your host and sailing addict, David Howes. Hi folks and welcome to episode 10 of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. This week we're talking with Jessica Watson who in 2010 was the youngest person ever to sail non-stop unassisted solo around the world. And so it's great catch up with Jessica to see what she's been up to over the past six years what she's working on now, uh, some some highlights from her trip and some of the challenges she faced. And uh, Jessica then catches up on the call with Andy Lamont and shares some advice for him as he sets off on his westward bound non-stop trip around the world later this year as part of his goal to set the world record for a yacht under the size of 40 feet. So it's a really interesting episode and I, I really hope you enjoy it. I just want to apologize for the audio issues later in the episode when we join Andy to the interview. Unfortunately, the Skype to mobile call meant the audio from his end wasn't that great. So some of his questions are a little bit hard to hear. Um, but uh, please be, please persist with the interview because it's uh, overall it's pretty good. But uh, there's a couple of spots where it's a little bit difficult to hear. So again, I apologize for that. Just a bit of a uh, recap on... Um, first 10 weeks of the Ocean Sailing Podcast has certainly been a busy 10 weeks for me and I've had the opportunity to talk to lots of interesting people and we've got a lot more people in the pipeline as well lining up and some good technical stuff ahead on uh, sail planning, sail making, uh, taking care of your hull and some stuff like that coming up over the next uh, three weeks and and, and then just to summarise I guess we've got listeners from from all over the world so uh, I thought I'd just share uh, and acknowledge those listeners, uh, the top 20 countries we have listening to the Ocean Sailing Podcast, um, starting from the top, Australia, United States, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, Canada, Ireland, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, the Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, France, Grenada, Italy, Portugal, Vietnam, Poland and Thailand. So Top 20 out of 53 countries, welcome to all of you. Thanks for tuning in to the Ocean Sailing Podcast and I'll do my best to make sure that the interviews we do and the stories we source uh, um, are broad and relevant to, to all of you as sailing really is quite a, a, a generic kind of sport where the principles are the same all over the world but I'll make sure that those interviews are as relevant as possible um, so that um, you will get a lot of enjoyment out of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. So enjoy this week's episode with Jessica Watson. People walk to me and say I'm sorry. Folks, welcome on to the Ocean Sailing Podcast. This week we are at the Queensland Cruising Yacht Club and we are talking to Jessica Watson. So welcome along, Jess. Hello and thanks for having me. Jess, uh, happy birthday for yesterday, I understand it was your birthday, and ironically, it, as part of researching questions for today, um, it's just gone past your six-year anniversary since you completed your circumnavigation. It has, it's just a bit scary, six years is, feels like a while, <laughs> a lot's Sorry. happened. Has it gone fast, or is it, have you just packed a lot into the last six years? It kind of feels like a couple of lifetimes ago, which sounds ridiculous for a 23-year-old to be saying that, but um, it, it really does, I mean, there's so many things that have happened, and it's, yeah, it's... Too much to keep up with and it feels like another world. Well, in six years, when you, given you were 17, almost 17 when you completed the trip, six years is a percentage of your life. You've had like another third of your life almost. Yeah, yeah, well, that's a good way of putting it and that's kind of how I feel, so yeah. <laughs> okay, and I, I read in your Wikipedia profile that you described, your nationality is described as a Australian New Zealand. I hadn't, oh, I hadn't heard of that gosh. nationality before, is that... How do, um, how do you see yourself? No, that's the problem with Wikipedia. I don't believe everything you read on it. Um, I mean, it is true to some extent, but I wouldn't call myself a Kiwi. Sorry, grandparents, but um, sorry, granddad particularly. He'd be a bit upset about that. But um, mum and dad come from New Zealand originally. Um, all my family are over there, but I, I do see myself as an Aussie through and through. Okay. Sorry to the Kiwis. Love the place. Great sailors, but um, I'm definitely an Aussie. It's a lot warmer here, right? It is, yeah. Okay, so today I wanted to talk to you touch on a few points so a few questions about your circumnavigation I want to talk to you a bit about life after the trip yeah. which has obviously been a big big chunk of your life really um, and, and then we'll, we'll talk a bit about your new project that you're, that you're working on right now um, Decky and, and, and how that came about um, and then and then we're going to give um, 
we're going to give Andy Lamont a bit of a surprise call um, and talk to him. He's, he's got some questions for you um, about his upcoming westward bound trip around the world in a, an SNS 34 called Impulse. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I'd love to hear his questions and have a chat to him. Okay, so so just, I guess, jumping back to your circumnavigation um, and just some, just some questions around that. So it appeared on reading your story you know, along the way and, and afterwards in depth that, that something that started out as, a, as an idea when you're a little bit younger turned into quite a serious, well-planned, well-thought-out project that they really gathered significant momentum in terms of the people and, and the sponsors and supporters that got behind it. And I guess my question for you is, were there moments as the departure date approached where you suddenly had flashes of panic or you got cold feet <laughs> and you thought, I don't want to do this anymore, but I've, I've come too far. I've got too many people behind it. No, not at all. And I'm glad about that because that would have been a pretty um, scary position to be in. Um, I think when I first started thinking about it and I realised, you know, you started doing that first bit of research and I realised, you know, it was young. I was sort of was 13 by the time I'd sort of made up my mind about it fully. So it was before then uh, that I'd been thinking about it for a while and I realised how much was involved and I always sort of knew from even right from then that if I was going to do this it had to be done properly it wasn't going to be a matter of getting a cheap boat and throwing together a few bits of equipment and a satellite phone and leaving you know if I was going to do it it had to be in the safest way possible and that meant yeah a lot of money and a lot of sponsorship and an incredible amount of support that did snowball you know first it was the local <laughs> sailmaker and rigger who were amazing and then it just snowballed into something bigger and I'm very happy that I didn't have cold feet at the last minute because, um, as you said, there was a lot behind it at that point. I was I was just I- probably the exact opposite. I was just itching to go the whole time and that was actually probably the harder part was to actually slow down and go, no, need to do this last part of the preparation properly rather than just wanting to get out there so badly. <laughs> okay, and so I guess then by the time you left, you were so well prepared and, and well travelled and you'd, you'd done so many thousands of sailing hours by that point that you were just comfortable and ready to ready to go yeah definitely um I mean I, well, you can always do more particularly solo in that boat I would love to have done more of that but it wasn't sort of possible with you know, have to be 16 and have your boat license it might have been an issue around sort of legally being able to skip a boat by myself um and just came down to time in the scenic seasons but we did decide that I'd sail through the Pacific first so that also gave me a first few months in a much better part of the world if any issues did come up with the boat which we weren't expecting you headed to like in a warmer direction to start with rather than yeah. a colder direction. Yeah, exactly. And just less terrible bit of ocean <laughs> to give the boat a good run in. Mm-hmm. Okay. And um, I read I read a comment, on the, I'm not sure it was a quote, a quote of yours, um, but um, it was along the lines of my mum and dad were, are quite timid when it comes to sailing and they wouldn't, they just wouldn't go out on a rough day, but it became my norm. And I, I just kind of wondered, have you always had that kind of gutsy give it a go kind of attitude? No, not at all. I think I, maybe it came from mum and dad who, you know, they enjoyed boating and a little bit of sailing but really aren't sailors um, at all. Uh, and I was very, very scared and timid when I first started sailing and you know, as a young girl and it was only a few years later that I decided I wanted to sail around the world. So that I kind of did it backwards. I realised that if I was going to sail around the world, I'd actually have to toughen up a little bit. <laughs> and, yeah, pretending helped to start with. Um, but I think my approach was quite typical of, I think a lot of adventurers rather than maybe a sort of typical kind of adrenaline junkie kind of idea of adventurer, um, my approach was kind of going back and looking at what could go wrong and that's kind of the part that fascinated me more than the sort of adrenaline huge waves sort of, I mean, I've always been interested in that, but um, it was more about what can we do to make this safer, which is, seems a bit boring, but that's the part that really fascinated me. Okay. And um, I guess reading about some of the extremes um, going around, Cape Horn and across the Great Australian Bight you had to endure 10 to 12 metre seas which most people can't appreciate that's a, that's sort of a you know a three to four storey building in terms of height um, and winds it up to 70 knots and, and several knockdowns and how would you describe to someone who's never sailed in rough weather what it's like uh, as a as a 16 year old on your own to be out on the ocean and in the dark in those kind of conditions how would you describe that um not easy to describe I suppose the first thing is and I sort of say this and it's not to sort of totally downplay what the conditions are like but we were expecting I was expecting conditions like that and the boat was built for those conditions in the end and and that gave me a lot of confidence you know if you put me out in those conditions in any old boat I would be utterly terrified <laughs> Uh, but because I knew I had, you know, absolutely every chance and, you know, we'd prepared to actually deal with these conditions, um, 
that gave me a lot of confidence. It's incredible. You know, it's, it, they're beautiful, the huge waves. Um, you know, it's just not something you see. It's just absolutely awe-inspiring. Uh, obviously, a little bit of terror comes into that as well. Um, you know, there are, and there were particularly a few hours in the Atlantic that were pretty horrible because it had a really horrendous knockdown where you're thrown into the trough of the next wave upside down and just not knowing how the boat could possibly be structurally sound after that. And I was sort of sitting there going, if we get another wave like that, you know, surely we can't survive. And pleasant surprise to realise that the boat was actually still okay. And it was my mind, more than anything, just getting away from me. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and, and with, with that, I guess one of the bigger risks for you would pro- was probably injuring, injuring yourself in the process rather than the injuring the boat and, and, and the risk of breaking ribs and bones and skull fractures. And how did you sort of manage your own safety in those types of extreme conditions? Yeah, that was something to be very aware of. You're completely by yourself, you know, days or even weeks away from help. So really it kind of came down to the way I sailed. There was just no risks taken. I'm very proud of the fact I never left the cockpit in over 30 knots of wind. I think it was once where I went forward, um, not even on the foredeck. Um, And that's pretty kind of crazy, really, to think that you can sail around the whole way around the world without leaving the cockpit in in over 30 knots of wind. So, you know, I had my storm jib up when a storm would approach and I'd just reef down from the cockpit and furl away the last bit of headsail. So very conservative and, and that was my approach to, to the way I did anything. You know, I, there were a lot of days when I was sailing a lot slower than I could have, um, you know, but again, just didn't like being cold and wet, but also <laughs> potentially hurting myself. Um, I had little lap belts for storms where I'd sort of sit down and belt myself in to not be thrown around. Inevitably, the worst knockdown happened when I wasn't buckled in um I remember walking up the walls onto the roof and I didn't get you, know, you get pretty bruised up in a storm like that but I, I didn't have any severe injuries at all we we did coat the inside of the boat with foam <laughs> um probably as much for insulation but also kind of going maybe maybe it'll help <laughs> yeah. um and the great thing about an SNS 34 is that it's, it's quite small in a cabin you know you go to sea in a modern racing boat or even a modern sort of cruising boat and it's quite terrifying moving around down below because it's you know this beautiful wide interior mm. <laughs> um you know there's the potential to be thrown 10 feet way across you can, the you can yeah before you hit something exactly so nice small SNS 34 was um yeah, a bit of security there as well okay now um i have to um, i was text this morning yeah. um by my daughter madison who who's 16 and has been doing a bit of offshore sailing with us now a bit of racing and oh, she had a, awesome. she's reading your book at the moment and she, she just texts me and she's like, Dad, I hope it's not too late, but I have, to, I have a couple of questions. Um, and we've already asked one, but the other one, other one was, um, you, she said, did, did, you ever, did you ever feel that you'd underestimated the, 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 the scale and the normative, enormity of the, of, the, of the journey and the trip um, compared to how it unfolded for you? Um, I'd probably honestly say no. I mean... In the, those hours and those moments when you're actually seeing those waves, you know, you, I spent so long imagining them and trying to work out what they'd be like um, and, you know, it's still you just can't really imagine. Um, but overall, I'm really quite proud of the fact that I had a lot of fun out there and that sounds a bit ridiculous, but, you know, before I left was so hard and, and even that whole incident where I hit that ship, which, you know, you look back and it did happen for a reason, um, as unpleasant as it was, I think all of that really did sort of toughen me up and I got out there and I actually, you know, it was tough. I'm told I'd do downplay it, but I had fun and I'm proud of that. You know, I enjoyed it as well as having <laughs> those tough times. Mm-hmm. And um, so did you find that that any sort of fears around some of the ex- more extreme weather just sort of eventually sort of fell away and you were more, you more became sort of in awe of the, the wonder of the, the forces of nature and and and. and, and and, and just the just the, the natural beauty of it, even though you can have the roughest, most crazy weather out there. And the most I've been in is maybe 45 knots and six metres, so not, and, yeah. and that was just, that was, um, that, that was, that got to a point quite quickly where you realised the boat's going to be okay. And it's just the awe of what's happening around you. Did you, did you get to that stage or did you still feel this sort of, this sort of um, un, un, unnerving sort of, are we going to be okay? Can it handle, can it handle everything that's ahead? Yeah, after that storm in the Atlantic, I had a, a big sense of, wow, the boat coped with that. It's still okay. Oh, my gosh. Like, <laughs> if it can survive that, it can survive anything. But um, – and, and that was, you know, a wonderful thing to experience and have that knowledge that it's really, really tough boat. <laughs> but then coming back towards Australia, I sort of got a, a period where there was storm after storm after storm and getting a bit closer to land again. 
um, that was pretty unnerving again. Um, you start throwing land into the mix, mm. things, things get pretty scary. Um, sea room's an incredible thing. Um, you know, most people still have this idea they want to run to shore and be near shore and it's, to me, you know, as a solo sailor, it's just the last thing you want to be near when you're in bad weather. Uh, so that was that was hard, and that was a you know healthy reminder again of, of how you know. And I think you never want to forget that as much as it's incredible. Um, yeah, it's important to <laughs> remember. It's quite amazing when it's just you on the ocean and you're on your own little circle of the planet, and there's just clear water in every direction to the horizon. It's just you in the ocean. There's no traffic around. And it's a lot safer, and it's uh, it's, it's quite magnificent. Obviously. <laughs> Obviously, ships never um, <laughs> gave me a lot of confidence having them around me. Um, and, yeah, there, there's something very special about an empty horizon in every direction, and I don't think many people understand that, but it, it is an incredibly, you know, I know, of course, it's lovely to share experiences with people and racing, and but there's also something very special about having it entirely to yourself. <laughs> so tell me about your sleeping patterns once you settled into the voyage. You hear about solo sailors being up for 20 minutes and down for 20 minutes, and uh, that sounds quite arduous if you were going to do that for 210 days. So what sort of patterns did you settle into once you got established on the journey? Yeah, um, it got better throughout throughout the voyage. It started out across the Pacific where you do have more islands and more shipping where I would be doing sort of 20-minute catnaps, 40 minutes, and then you know, the advice we sort of got and all the research we did sort of pointed towards you really need to get a 90-minute sleep cycle in every 24 hours. And I was getting in a couple of them. You know, it wasn't... It sounds incredibly harsh. I think people just hear that and go, oh, my goodness, how do you do that? You, you get used to it. It's um, it's the first few days that are often very tough. You know, the first three days typically, and it's a shame that most people only ever at sea for three days because it's it's wonderful after that once you've found your legs and you know in a new sleeping pattern. And I would get a lot of my best sleep in the morning. You know, after the sun had kind of risen and you'd, you'd be able to relax just that little bit more. Um, and then when I got further south, there's a lot less down there in the Southern Ocean. So I would be sleeping for, you know, 90 minutes at a time and then waking up quickly, checking things and going back to sleep. It's a lot better. In terms of collision avoidance at sea, did you use radar, AIS? And what sort of range alarms did you set? Uh, AIS, um, it's just fantastic. I mean, the radar's great, but choose through a lot of power and um, even just the alarms, I don't think are really... You know, when you're out in the middle of the ocean, really it's just big ships or ocean-going vessels that you're dealing with. So, um, you know, they're on the AIS, which is fantastic. And the alarms that you can set up were just fantastic. Um, you know, obviously once I was well out to sea, you just... Well, any time actually by myself when I'd ever be thinking about sleeping, you'd have it just the furthest setting and if anything comes onto the, onto the you know screen at all which could be quite a number of um miles away depending on the, the conditions for the radio and um yeah it, that'd wake me up with a very very loud alarm my alarm was incredibly loud <laughs> uh and the AAS was um something we changed I had a couple of them after the collision and that one of the reasons for the collision was the fact that the AAS hadn't gone off as as it should have yeah right so uh the great thing about AIS is uh, especially in bad weather when you can see a vessel 90 minutes away, not just a few minutes away, um, how amazing that is in terms of uh, being safe and confident at night in the dark in, in, in really adverse conditions. And especially being able to understand the closest point of approach and, and, and how long that's going to take before you're at that point uh, instead of trying to guess in the dark which side of your boat the vessel's going to pass, whether you're on a con collision course, because uh, it's amazing how deceptive seeing lights in the dark are, uh, in the dark is and, and, and being able to judge depth and, th and those sorts of things. Without a doubt, you don't have to sit there on deck for you know the hour it takes to pass, and better still, there were a couple of occasions when a ship looked like it was going to be a little bit close, and I'd literally call them up on the radio and go, hey, it's looking a little <laughs> hint, hint, do you want to get out of my way? <laughs> Give me a bit more room so I don't have to go out in the cold and jibe. And a couple of times they talked them into it. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. I think they were just so shocked from hearing this little girl's voice on the radio yeah. that they're going, what's That's going on here? <laughs> okay, so let's jump to the conclusion of your trip on May the 15th, 2010. You stepped ashore in front of 70,000 people. Did you did you do anything to prepare for that, that you know great down-to-earth speech that you gave in that moment? Or did you just sort of step ashore and, and just wing it? Um, no, I mean, I knew, I think everyone had told me what I should expect and I'm glad about that because it might have been a bit too overwhelming if I just stepped off and, 
been hit with that. Um, and the most incredible thing was that the couple of days before, because I was running, a, well, not a bit early, but everyone sort of wanted to set a date and even all my New Zealand relatives and all the people who'd supported me wanted to be there. And, and I was, at that point, if I'd wanted to come in, I would have just come straight in. Yeah. But I was very happy to sort of hang out and wait a couple of days, just slow right down. Um, and those couple of days were just the most amazing thing because I was able to sort of let it sink in, get my head together and then be ready for <laughs> the day I got in. And it was, it was just overwhelming. You know, I'm sure anyone who's been at sea knows that feeling of returning to a port and everything feels so close. Mm. And, you know, you've had empty horizons and just seen, you know, I only saw land three or four times the entire time. It's pretty boring. And everything feels overwhelming, close and intense. You know, the, any, every smell and every sight is, is just a lot more intense than it normally is. And how challenging was it readjusting to life on the land? Uh, getting back into a schedule and uh, having people all around you again? Oh, look, it was all just, I think I was riding a wave of adrenaline for a couple of years. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating there. Um, it was it was incredible. You know, I, I think a lot of people worried about how I might adjust, but because it was just so many positive things happening. Um, and I, I was a little bit strange and I had a bad case of the sea legs. I think I used to, strange in that I used to never talk to people looking at their face <laughs> and some silly little habits that I, I gained like that. It just from being by yourself for so long. Um, but I, honestly, I, it was all so exciting and new because you're doing these things you haven't done. You know, even the smallest things were a novelty. Just mm. being able to go for a walk, you know, that was still something I was enjoying months after. And what doors have opened since May 2010 as you entered the next chapter of your life uh, that have really surprised you that you didn't see coming? Oh, look, there are so many things. Um, you know, one of the wonderful things was being able to go and actually do a bit of travelling afterwards. Um, I'd sailed around the world, but I hadn't seen a lot of it. So whether that was sort of book tours in all sorts of parts of the world and boat shows and, you know, Brazil and Europe and actually being able to do a bit of sailing um, in the minis over in France, um, really loved that. Um, was sort of thinking, you know, whether I go down that competitive path for a while. And the Youth Sydney Hobart project we did is something I'm really proud of. Um, that was a big project, took a while, a lot of effort and energy went into that and really proud of the result and, and taught me a huge amount um, sailing wise but but more much more than that as well in terms of people management leadership and some of the skills like that yeah and we had the opportunity to work with some really amazing mentors and, and partners um, Deloitte was one of our sponsors and they put us through some of their sort of leadership and team um, very corporate style um, training and teamwork programs and that was really amazing to mm. apply that to a basically a bunch of teenagers on a, on a yacht for sailing and I read about your role with the United Nations and your trip to Jordan and Lebanon where you met with Syrian refugees. Do you want to tell me about that? Yeah, I mean, obviously the, the wonderful thing is that I've had the opportunity to support a lot of different organisations in the last few years and, and, you know, this is one that sort of has become a bit more of a long-term role rather than a sort of once-off. Um, and I've been over to, to Laos and to see the sort of school feeding programs over there and then, yeah, recently last year to Jordan and Lebanon um, I mean, they're just an you know, incredible organisation on a global scale and, you know, things like particularly with Laos is issues that are in our backyard and hunger and um, I think I'm just, you know, you meet the families and the kids and they're very inspiring but I'm normally more inspired by the, the workers and what goes into, you know, it's not as simple as just dumping some food. <laughs> um, so quite extraordinary and, and I'm just so lucky to have had those experiences. It's, you know, again changed me and taught me so much. Well, it must be a pretty amazing perspective you have of the world now that you've had the opportunity to see it from so many different angles. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Very lucky to have had that. Um, and the funny thing is, you know, you think I'd, I sort of expected to walk away very upset from the refugee camps, but I actually walked away so inspired because I met some people who were making the best out of these situations. And you come back here and, and my big sort of feeling was that we need to make the most of what we've got here, um, you know, not waste it. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a documentary called The Happiness Project, which uh, is about where the happiest nations are in the world. And interestingly, some of the African nations rank the highest because the gap between their expectations and how they actually live is, is, is nil. Yeah. As opposed to many of the Western nations where there's lots of unhappiness because the gap between where they are today and, and their high ideals is, is vast. And so it's interesting when you talk about people being happy with their lot uh, and being happy with exactly where they are despite how little we may perceive they may have yeah probably part of the reason I had a lot of fun sailing around the world as well because I had this expectation that it was going to be miserable a lot of the time <laughs> got out there and realized it was actually quite enjoyable the majority of the time 
Okay, so how much public speaking do you still do today? I guess there was a lot immediately after your trip, but do you still do much public speaking today? Mm, um, a bit, a lot less than it was for a couple of years there, but um, I still do a fair bit, and I have come to really enjoy it. I, I went through a period where I was just so sick of talking about sailing around the world, but I'm really happy that I've found a sort of way of enjoying that again, and and you know bringing some of my other experiences into that, which is, is something yeah that I feel like is a good story and I enjoy talking about now. Okay, and whereabouts are you currently living? Mostly down in Melbourne, um, but I'm still up here in Queensland a fair bit with parents and family, and um, I do seem to end up in Sydney a fair bit too. So East Coast Australia, I think, is a, okay. a safe. Okay, and I read that you don't really feel the urge to become a professional sailor and cruising's more your thing. Uh, did you ever feel the urge or the weight of public expectation when you returned from your circumnavigation with questions from the public about you know what's next for Jessica or what's, uh, what's your next challenge and, and some sort of obligation to uh need to uh find new challenges to take on yeah there's there's the one thing that people say and it seems to be literally the second thing they say to me is what's next what are you going to do to better that and I really struggle with that because everything I've done since and you know finishing my degree and and studying different things now have bettered that to me (laughs) but um you know there, there people do seem to want me to go and do something more dramatic and media worthy than what I've done and and I'm never going to do that for that reason. Um, yeah, and it's quite funny that some people seem to think that there's some sort of ownership over me and what I should do, you know, that they have <laughs> some sort of say in, in what they think I should be doing. Um, and, you know, it was something I was quite seriously considering whether I would want to pursue racing, sailing, and, you know, maybe race around the world by myself or something. Um, but I kind of have come to realise it ta- took me a couple of years that I just don't have a competitive bone in my body, so it <laughs> wouldn't have worked too well for me. <laughs> And sometimes when something becomes a job, it's not as much fun anymore as well. And that's something that's I've become more and more aware of, and that's really important to me. I want, you know, I love sailing and I love every part of it, and I want it to be something that's a big part of my life for the rest of my life, rather than something I do as a job. Okay, and how did you feel about Alice Pink Lady being preserved forever in the Queensland Maritime Museum? Yeah, that's the perfect place for it. I mean, by the time we'd finished setting her out for the voyage, she was sort of set out for one thing only and, um, you know, wasn't going to help me with any of the racing I wanted to do. So that's the best place for her. A bunch of school gets, kids get to go visit and I go visit every now and again. And yeah, that's pretty cool and nice to think she's not just going to deteriorate on a mooring somewhere and eventually get degraded like many other boats that don't get the attention they deserve. Yeah, exactly. It's just wonderful. Um, I didn't have the time in those first few years to look after her and yeah, who knows what happens in the future in this way she's looked after forever. So let's talk about Decky and your investment in that. It's a technology-based solution uh, around the marine industry and and has had some investment to date of some $90,000. And the Decky website talks about being a service provider to a marine industry of more than a million boat owners that spend some $2 billion a year on, on services and storage and products and uh, you have aspirations as a business for going overseas at some point and the uh, business has uh, been part of the Slingshot Accelerator program and picked up a whole bunch of awards including tourism awards, uh, startup awards and digital creativity awards. So tell me about your role and, and how did you get involved? Yeah, I heard about it, oh gosh, it would have been late last year, maybe even more like middle of last, that would have been more like middle of last year. Um, and then Mike had been through the Accelerator program, Mike's the founder. Um, and I heard about what they were doing and, and I suppose I just immediately saw there was a need for it. And, you know, as a boatie, you're travelling up the coast and you want to know um, where you should be finding the best marine businesses and locations. And, you know, we have all these fantastic cruising guides, which are wonderful, but, you know, huge big books in 2017, 16. Um, you know, there should be a place for that on the internet. And I kind of eventually got involved because I realised that that's something I wanted to be part of and to give the, the boating community, particularly the, the sort of cruising sailing community, a place um, and an amazing resource online. So, yeah, my role is sort of communications manager, but there's only the three of us, so it, it does mean a bit of everything for now, which is really wonderful. It's I absolutely love it because it's, it's working with you know, amazing boaties all over the place and... Um, really exciting we've got some great things happening with a a rebuild of the site um pretty much done now so looking forward to to rolling that out and getting some feedback on that as well yeah certainly great having everything online and on demand at your fingertips these days instead of having to carry everything on board and when you pull into a a new destination or a new area you may not have the information you need so having that online on demand is fantastic 
Yeah, yeah, and obviously the other big thing about decking. So it, essentially, it's a, you know, part of the idea is a trip advisor for boating. Um, so to have that information there from other people, um, you know, not just the one author. You, you've got comments and reviews from a whole range of boaties who might have been there just the week before. So that's that's where it will become really really useful as everyone jumps on board as I'm sure they will be as they hear this and and and, you know actually help the rest of the community out by sharing their opinion as well and just to clarify it's decky.com that's d-e-c-k-e-e.com that's right yep yeah put it in google or dot com it's not that hard (laughs) okay and how old is the business now well, it'd be, it's just over a year now. Um, yeah, learned a lot in that first year, slowly and steadily growing and really hoping for some exciting things around this um, new website. Okay, and what's your ultimate vision for the business and your plans beyond Australia? Ultimately, yeah, to provide a really helpful resource for the boating and sailing community, um, Australia first, but um, certainly, you know, if it's something that works here and it's useful here, um, there's a need for it around the world as well. So mm-hmm. we'll see, see where we go. Okay, and how many businesses do you have listed on there currently? We've got uh, close to 4,000, um, which I think out of what, six or 7,000 um, businesses um, is, is significant. There's still yeah. a way to go there. So obviously we're asking marine businesses to get in touch and, and definitely list their details. Um, and there's um, yeah the opportunity to sort of be listed as a directory there, um, but then also some of the ways it will be built in with locations and, um, yeah, and encourage your customers to actually leave the feedback there. You know, there's all this amazing feedback and, and people do want to say great things and this is the platform for it. Great. And what sort of feedback have you had so far from the customers and the businesses that are benefiting from the platform? We're certainly seeing that people are saying that you know, there's a need for it. You know, there, there are only so many options from the business's perspective um, where you can be advertising your product and where is it actually relevant to be advertising, getting the word out um, about your business. Um, certainly that customer feedback is quite new too. You know, we're seeing in every other industry that that's becoming a really important, um, really, really important marketing tool. Um, and it's just there, isn't, there hasn't been a platform for that for the marine community yet. Uh, and from a user feedback, um, obviously... The more people on there, the more useful it gets. Um, hearing some positive things um, so far, um, but we just know that you know the more people are on there using it, the, the better it gets, and that's that's the important thing to, to get to that point. And what are the biggest things that are driving the growth of the site at the moment? Well, we are seeing a lot of people kind of discovering it um, through people, friends telling them about it. Um, we're getting out and doing sort of being part of as many community events as possible. Um, and then also through sort of the stories in the blog style articles that we're writing, um, putting out a couple, normally a one or two a week, and, and a lot of people are reading that, sharing that, and, and hearing about Zeki that way as well, which is wonderful. Okay, I've been chasing somebody for some details for a survey for three weeks for a uh, survey that I need to get done for insurance. And last night I thought, why don't I just go into Decky, look up the Gold Coast and see what's there. And sure enough, I found a survey straight away in, in Palm Beach and got the contact details and straight onto it. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, if you can just Google the stuff, often you go mental because it brings up such broad results that it doesn't often find what you're looking for. Well, that's exactly it. Is is that, look, I would, this is probably jumping ahead of myself a little bit here, is I'd love to see Decky become a bit of a Google for the boating mm-hmm. world. You know, it's a place that you actually trust and you know that it's actually boaties on there, so it's information for boaties rather than having to contend with everything on Google, yes. Um, yeah, and, and we've had good feedback and, and that was around the award wins too about the design of the site, so something we're keeping in mind as we build the new one as well. Yeah, it's a good looking site and I found it easy to use and I think the review based concept is a really smart one. Yeah, yeah, right direction, but, but um, as I said, learning a lot as well, which is really important because you know we want to be providing the most useful tool possible. And what do you need more of right now to drive your growth? Is it business listings or, or customers or essentially eyeballs and traffic to drive leads and contact to those businesses? Uh, it's hard to know what comes first, but um, really our focus is with the user and particularly a lot of our sort of cruising sailors who um, are typically really generous people who want to share. Um, you know, your average racing sailor might be a little more busy and you know, heads down to the boat on the weekend and doesn't have a lot of spare time, but um, cruising sailors are really generous and want to spread their opinions, which is wonderful. So really engaging with them is number one concern and getting them on board and using the site and hearing what they want want to be using and how, what they want to see um, and then I think the businesses are seeing once there's a you know a huge amount of people using the site and finding it useful that it's something they want to be part of. And uh, are there any other similar websites in the world for the marine industry that are similar to Decky or is what you're doing here quite unique? 
It is quite unique. There's a, a few sort of similar concepts and in the States um, and we're seeing and globally a few sort of sites book some pretty incredible sort of marine marina booking platforms and things like that popping up which are it's great to see that um, you know people are again sort of saying that they want these resources online um, but so far yeah something that is is quite unique but we'll, we'll see what happens I imagine in the next few years as well. Okay. Um, so so Jess, is there anything else you want to tell me about Dickie or anything else you want to share about Dickie and um, plans and ideas for that before we give Andy a call? No, look, I really want to encourage people to get on there and, and use it. And also we really love feedback and, and honest feedback. Um, you know, that's what's going to help us um, grow and improve. Um, so keen to hear that and, and hear what people think as the new site's launched as well. So please do get on board and, you know, share your opinions, good good and bad and, and you know, your favourite anchorage and... Um, yeah, what, what's good about that and, you know, what people need to be aware of. And the more people share, the more people get to benefit from that sharing and exactly. those reviews and that information. Just becomes more and more useful, yes. Yeah, great great resource from that point of view. Definitely, yeah. Okay, so so uh, Andy Lamont, I'm going to jump online and we're going to, uh, we're going to call him through Skype to his mobile. Um, and we're going to have a chat to Andy because I, I, I spoke to Andy maybe a couple of months ago. Uh, he's got He's got a... a trip coming up um a big trip going west going upwind for some crazy reason yeah i don't it's pretty crazy <laughs> around the world and he's uh he's fair to say he's certainly a uh, he's a fan of yours and he when i spoke to him i said you know if you had some questions for jessica watson what would they be and he said oh i don't know i've asked you about this and this and that and this and that and so so got me thinking at the time oh maybe i could you could I could organize for you to have a chat to him um and maybe you could ask he could ask you those questions directly no, I'd love to I always um love somebody who's, who's chosen the right boat for the <laughs> for the voyage hi Andy speaking hey Andy it's David here hey Dave how you going mate good thanks can you hear me okay yeah you're just a little bit faint but I can hear you. okay okay I'll try and speak up so um so Andy I've got somebody else here that uh it's going to have a chat to you um, about your upcoming westward-bound trip around the world, and she's uh, listening in the background. Hello. In, in fact, we might have to ask a bit closer um, so she can hear you. But I have Jessica Watson here, Andy. Hi, Jessica. How are you going? Yes. Hi. Good. How are you? Good. Thanks. How are you going? Yeah. Good. Good to hear about your trip. Oh, that's good. So, oh, is that you? Is it Jessica Watson? Is it? Yes, yes. Sorry. <laughs> How many Jessicas oh. do you know? I recognise your voice. Yeah. No, oh, thanks for calling, Jessica. Yeah. No, no problem. So, um, so Andy, we're doing an episode for the podcast, and and Jessica and I've been having a chat for the last hour or so. Um, so when I spoke to you a couple of months ago, you said if you could speak to Jessica, there's some questions you'd like to ask as part of your preparation. So, so now you have the opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's great. I love your um choice in boat, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was good to get an S S thirty four, so and um yeah, so I've been doing it up. Um but yeah, so and, and where are you now? Just you're in up in north in, in Sunny Coast eh? or uh, in Brisbane. I'm down in Melbourne a lot these days, but um yeah, Brisbane today. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. And but, you're you're Gold Coast yeah. based, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, so um, yeah, so I head off in October, uh, and um, I'm going west about. Um, but yeah, there were some things I wanted to ask you about, and I've got a bit of a blank at the moment. I, th- I, <laughs> thought, they were. I thought you would, so I've written down your questions for you, Andy, because I remember some of them. And <laughs> good on you. Why not? I thought you would be putting you on the spot. So one of the questions you you said you would like to to know more about is um. The, the sail configurations for each wind level and what, what Jessica found to be the, the best settings as, as the wind range went up? Yeah, 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 that would be interesting to know, yeah. And at what point, uh, at what point she changed from a Genoa to a Phil Genoa yeah. and a Genoa to a Jib and Reef the Main and things like that, so... so yeah, yeah, that yeah, would, yeah that'd be good to know how you went with that. Yeah, well, yeah. I suppose um, I kept it all pretty basic. It wasn't, um, you know, there was certainly no racing trim with a lot of it. Um, so really it yeah. was just the, the main with, I had three reefs in it, which was fantastic. Um, and the Genoa, which I just fell away a bit of as it got windier. Um, and then the big thing I did yeah. is put, I used to say stay, stay sail a bit, which was good, but probably not 
you know, I don't think it was the made made a huge amount of difference. Um, but then I'd yeah. keep the storm sail um, on the um, stay sail and just uh, you could I'd leave that up for quite a while. It wasn't doing any damage um, you know, before or after a storm to have it up there, you know, ready. Um, and, right. and I think, yeah. I don't know, I suppose the big thing is, I mean, just getting the main down earlier um, so it's not overpowering it. You know, when you're sailing, I don't know if you'll have a wind vane, but, um, yeah, you just, yeah, you just can't sail with too much sail area with a wind vane. You've got to be a bit more conservative. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so I'm just sitting there. I just spoke to Bill, um, Bill George just sent me up a wind vane, actually. Oh, so wonderful. I just did it last week, yeah. So, yeah, that's the thing. You've got to, um, you've got to balance the boat, hey, just keep that. Yeah, and I, I'd highly recommend a, a nice small third reef. Not that on an SNS thirty four sale it could be that big anyway. A third reef. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, good. So that's good to know. So yeah, well, I've got a small third reef, but I'm probably going to do it. Uh, and did you just have the one main for the whole trip? I did. I had a I had a spare, which wouldn't have been a great sale, but um, I, I didn't need it. I, I was stitching it up a little bit. There was you know a little little bits of damage and things. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's so, so it lasted the whole trip for you. Yeah, it, it did, um, but it was it was well, suffering a bit towards the end. So I, yeah, I wouldn't. I'd definitely yeah. be um, taking a spare. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've got a spare. I thought I might get another new one made, but I've got a spare sort of. Old main that came from the boat. So that was an idea I had of having another main, just like a new one ready to pop up just in case. Yeah, yeah, um, probably do the job. And, yeah, oh, that's good to know. And um, uh, what about things that, like, um, you, um, did the wind generator go well the whole way? The wind vane, sorry? No, the generator, the, um, oh. the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the wind the generator. I think it had them. Yeah. Uh, I no, I did actually replace that quite towards the end of the trip. It was it was fantastic. I liked it. Um, and I yeah, I, I had a spare whole unit, which um, you know, might have been able to problem solve with the the first one. Um, I don't know. Someone with a bit more technical knowledge and experience might have been as well. But I had the spare there, and I just replaced it. Um, right. Which was yeah, which is fantastic. But yeah, you really need need your different options with the solar and and even being able to run. You know, I was running the engine out of gear a fair bit, which is not overly great for it either. But um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you so you found your solar was pretty pretty much not not really that much drop down down the Southern Ocean. Um, no, I still found it a surprising help um, down south. It was more that they, um, well, one of them particularly got a bit smashed up during some knockdowns yeah. and was a bit le- less effective after that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's good to know. And, um, so you took all your water, didn't you? Uh, yeah, but I was... You, you, have, you didn't use them. I'm gone, you catch them. I was catching a lot. Um, I only I, my water maker was only like a little hand backup one, so it was really only going to get me out of trouble in a sort of survival situation. Um, yeah, but I was I was very surprised and impressed with how much I was able to collect. Um, yeah, um, yeah, particularly through the Pacific, which might not be as much help for you, but um, uh, the gutter, yeah, uh, well, I, little I gutter set. Yeah, I'm going up. I've got it under um, Cape Horn. I'm going straight home, so yeah. I'm going the other way. So yeah. So little gutters on your um, dodger on your on your, on your, on your oh, dodger, yeah. They oh, were they very well effective. Today. Yeah, they were great, and then obviously just um, you know, you turn run with it if once you've sort of washed the salt off and um, put the um topper on the end of the boom, pull it up a bit and let it all run off the the gooseneck. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, that's good to know. Um, yeah, um uh, what about uh, is there anything you would have done? Differently now that you've done it once, like as far as the the boat goes, or what's that? Sorry, would I do anything differently? Yeah, would you sort of think, oh, that was a bad idea to, to you know rely on certain things, or um, anything you would have done differently? Look, honestly, there was very little with the boat, which was fantastic. Um, I, I don't know if I if I was me now, I'd probably actually you know, enjoy sailing it a little bit better <laughs> and, you know, get the code zero out and things like that. Um, but, mm. I mean, equipment-wise, yeah, really very little. Um, 
yeah, there was a you know a few things that corroded and didn't sort of work, and I rigged up a new little battery meter. But you know, there were all such small things that didn't really matter. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I can't honestly say that there'd be one sort of big thing that would really <laughs> I'd changed. It's yeah, yeah. the right boat well, for it, and um, yeah. yeah, just yeah. keep it simple with the equipment and back up for everything. It's really <laughs> all there is to it. Yeah. And did you have separate build? Did you close up all your builders, or did you have it all draining in under the motor? And oh no, sorry, you didn't have the motor in the center, did you? So did you have your um, build just separate, or was it just one big build throughout um, the whole boat? Yeah, they were quite separate, and there were some pretty impressive um, bilge pumps in all of them, and and hand pumps as well. Um, probably a bit overboard. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So have you got the engine in the center, do you? Yep. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I've got the engine in the centre. Yeah, but um, so but you know, I'm I'm, I'm I want to um, close off because it all drains into the build, the one build, yeah, under okay. the motor. And um, I was I was wanted to ch- sort of change it all up so that uh, I'll, I'll separate, uh, so I have a forward build and a midships build and an aft build so that um, you know if there is water coming, I know where it's coming from and. Did you have that, or did you just have it all? Were they all separated? The builders? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was quite separated. Obviously, up the front. I think the engine really was a bit separate, but I, you know, it got to a point and it would just drain in. Um, and I did have a pretty leaky um, prop sh- um, prop gland, a stern gland. Um, oh, did you? Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which That's didn't annoying. worry me, yeah. but um, it, it, you know, towards the end, it was getting a little um, yeah, <laughs> a little worse, which wasn't ideal. Yeah. Yeah. And was that a um, just a um, stuffing box gland or a BSS? Yeah, it was. So yeah, wasn't wasn't too much I could do about it, but it it didn't really matter too much. I just had to make sure I was pumping out every now and again. Right. Yeah. Uh, cool. Well, that's pretty interesting. Um, and what about um, the uh, the boat itself? Did you um, did you do much? Um, I know you you did, you've had um, sex days, didn't you? So not root full. Full running back, but just yeah, is that right? On your... Yep, that's yeah. right. I, don't, I mean, I don't know how my rig was definitely pretty overkill, so um, you yeah, know, whether, whether that's entirely necessary, but I suppose yeah, the rigger just thought that yeah. there's absolutely no harm at the time, yeah, yeah. I know you found the check stays were pretty easy to deal with, you didn't have any problems with the accident. Did you have a boom break? Oh, what? Sorry, a boom break. Um, I I did use one a bit to start with, but I actually just found that you really like your only option is just to run a um, preventer and you know just run something you know towards the front of the boat and back and because yeah. because you're only yeah. tacking every few days, it's no <laughs> no big deal just to set it up yeah. again. Yeah, set it up. Yeah. And and that oh, really is the only thing yeah. yeah that I found really effective. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Well. Um, yeah, that's great. Well, you know, as time comes closer, I'll um, uh, sort of get the boat ready now. I've been sort of working on it for about 18 months, just slowly getting everything done. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was sort of a really interesting thing I wanted to talk to you about. And the main thing was that you sort of, you just sort of think pretty much, the boat's pretty much standard as it, as it comes and you handle everything pretty good and you know, really... Systems. What did you use for your navigation? Did you used a um, chart plotter, did you? Or yeah, yeah, chart plotter. Um, but I also just had um, had the software on the computer on the tough book, um, which was great. And then, oh, okay. And then all the all the backup GPS handhelds and charts, which hopefully mm. never had to get used. And there was even a sextant on board, which I would have been in trouble if I'd needed that. Might have eventually found um, <laughs> <laughs> found where I was, but. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the same. Yeah, I've got like a million different GPSs. Yeah, exactly. No, I wonder how the second thing works. So. Yeah, likelihood yeah. of needing it's pretty low. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Andy, uh, David here. Um, when we were talking, you were you were had some some questions around uh, downwind sailing and and whether you were going to, you know, pole out your Genoa or run wing and wing or or what have you. Did you do you have any? Other questions around down, downwind sailing sail configuration, um, at all? You didn't, did you run twin head at all, Jessica? Or? No. I never did, no. I mean, I, it probably would have helped. I mean, I, 
Yeah, but I just, I never did. I had a code zero too, which I reckon was pretty useful. Um, I didn't use it a huge amount, mm. but um, yeah, polling out, definitely be a good thing to be able to do, but I never tried the double. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, because I read, um, I was all, all keen to, to poll out and do, and do that. And uh, I read, reread John Sanders' book and he was like saying that, um, he didn't believe it. He didn't want to poll out the um, Junoa because it worked the four stay too much. And I was thinking, oh, you know, <laughs> so I might not do so much of that polling out. So, but um, that was what I was talking to David about the, um, whether or not to, to use the poll or not. Yeah, so, I'd, I mean, I'd, yeah. I'd definitely have it with you, but um, yeah, I mean, John's the the real expert. You can go around three times. You, you're gonna really get it. Yeah. You're gonna have to really keep an eye on what what's gonna wear out and <laughs> what's gonna be an issue. Make uh, sure. Um, yeah. Wow. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll do, do get in touch. Um, if there's anything closer to the time, um, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of good people, and t- you're talking to, talking to all the right people. I'm sure, but. Yeah. How much metadata did you take? Oh, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but it would be in the back of my book. <laughs> um, I actually had far too much, though. Oh, it's so in the back of your book, is it? I, yeah. I think it is, right. but um, if not, I'll, um, I'll, yeah. I'll follow up with that. But um, I'm, I did have yeah, far no, too much. Um, I was, yeah, yeah. didn't need quite that and much. You had the Origo? You had the Origo method, didn't you? Uh, yes, yep, yep, that was the one. And, and that was great with the, the little cylinders it had, so it was completely sealed and there was no way that any meth could spill uh, even completely upside down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got one of those. Yeah, fantastic. So, oh, great. So yeah, so 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 you took. So do you do you know if you had a lot left over when you came back, or whether you sort of? Because I can have a look at how much it took, and and uh, or do you remember that or not? Yeah, no, I do. I do remember there was a lot left over. So whatever. Oh, was it? However much I took. Um, whatever you took was too much. <laughs> But um, I suppose it's it's something that you don't want to be running out of, so you, you know. No. Yeah. yeah exactly. Cold food would be pretty miserable. Yeah. Um. Oh, that's good, uh, yeah. Well, good luck with the wind vane. Oh. Um. It's it's awesome. It takes a bit of getting used to. I'm sure you've used one before, but um, lots and no, lots of um. Oh, okay. Spare blades. Loads of spare ones because I did yep. snap a few of them. Um. And also lines. You, you can never have enough lines because they did, even if, you know, I Thanks. set it up perfect, it'll still chafe a lot. Yeah. 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 So, well, that's good. so that's good. So I'll take lots of, um, lots of spare lines. It's so, it's so light, so you can sort of take as many as you need, don't you? Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, yeah, um, on, honestly, however many you think, just add a few more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What about um, Andy Do you, know, you remember what Andy you used? Um, it was an international brand, um, and there was a lot of it on there. <laughs> um, was there? I, yeah, there was. Um, probably the only thing there is you, you, you probably couldn't go high enough, you know, because um, that's where I had a bit of growth is just above the – because you obviously healed right over and then so much water um, higher up. Yes. That it was yeah. – it was, we yeah, probably should exactly. have gone even higher than we thought. Yeah, yeah, I hear yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Actually, I was thinking I might even put a a vinyl um, a vinyl stripe above my waterline and and sell that. It's probably six or seven inches above the waterline because yeah, they do tend to um, get dirty, don't they? they get get close above the waterline. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Good, you know? Yeah. Oh well, that's good. Um, yeah. Well, look, I really appreciate you taking my call. Just to uh, explain. Um, Glad to, glad to contact you. I sort of followed you when you were answering around. And, uh, so, you know, fantastic to you. Uh, it's, you know, it was very inspiring. So it's great to talk to you. Um, and, uh, yeah, if I can, uh, if, I, if I come up with something, you know, um, I might um, shoot you an email or something like that if I uh, need some advice on something. Yeah, no, please uh, do. But, you're, you're, oh, thanks. But you're, but what you're saying is pretty much your boat was perfect as it was. Oh. Didn't give you any problems the whole way. Well, perfect in that, that we didn't get tempted to overcomplicate anything. You know, if you keep it simple, there's only so much that can go wrong. So, um, exactly. yeah. yeah. I'm sure there's there's more we could have yeah. done to get the right speed and different things out of it, but um, <laughs> it wasn't about that. And yeah. No, same, same for me. It's about finishing, really. That's the main thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, well, good good luck with it. I'm I'm sure you'll be sort of posting or updating somehow on the way and look forward to yeah, following yeah. as well. Yeah, well, I will be. Dave will be working with me on that, so it'll be great. So, um, so thanks very much for uh, talking with me, Jessica, and uh, you have a great day. And I'll um I'll, I'll shoot you an email, and so you've got my email address if you ever want to talk to me about anything if I can, if you, if I can, um, can I, can I get an email address off Dave for you or? Sounds good. Yeah, we'll do yeah, that. We can arrange that. All right. That'd be great. And I'll shoot you an email and if I've got some questions, um, uh, I might just shoot you an email and yeah, I've got some answers and I'd really appreciate it. So thanks very much and, uh, thank you. All right. Oh. I won't hold you up much longer, but thanks for your time, Jessica. No problem. Good luck with all the, the work. All right, buddy. Thanks very much. Thanks, Andy. See you then. See you later on. Bye. Bye. All right. Yeah. So, um, I think we did pretty well. That's, um, a few challenges just getting yeah, yeah. sound clarity and stuff. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, thanks for doing that. Um, no I problem. I know uh, Andy's been consuming all of the good advice that he can <laughs> from all sorts of people, and as much as he can, he can read and prepare, and he's got a, a massive to-do list, as you can probably appreciate. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah. Never ending. Yeah, no, it's it's funny because I sort of go, oh, I don't know how much there is I can sort of tell them, but you start realizing all these little things, and um, yeah, it's yeah that there are are a lot of simple little things that would possibly make a big difference. I saw one of your presentations once, and the thing I actually truly felt sorry about, sorry for you on was uh, having to rebuild the toilet because yeah. I had to do that once. <laughs> it's not a very pleasant job. No, um, no, that was one thing that it fell apart during knockdowns. Um, yeah, a bit annoying. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, that's great. Um, so, is there anything else you want to touch on before we wrap up today, Jess? Is there anything else you want to share or talk about? No, look, I, I think I'm, I'm good. I mean, yeah, as, as I said, it's, it's, I love sailing of all kinds these days and I love good stories and, you know, following, I'm looking forward to following trips like that. It's a wonderful thing to be able to do. I think that internet and you know, things like this these days, you can just follow such great stories from around the world from, from home. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, one question, um, one last question on that. What, what percentage of your trip was, you know, reaching or down when sailing, would you, would you say, uh, versus going upward? <sighs> it, it, yeah, I don't know. It probably maybe only half or I don't know. I've never really kind of looked at okay. it in percentage terms. The yeah. So I was just wondering if we work, yeah. work back with what percentage <laughs> of this trip's going to be upward as opposed to downward. Yeah, he's in a bit more trouble. But um, I reckon, you know, I reckon as much as, of course, it's into the prevailing. But mine was probably a bit unique because I, I was supposed to be further south, um, you know, the idea is, you know, you're down south and you've got more wind behind you, uh, stronger and faster. But I tended to enjoy sunshine and warmth. And the whole way across the Indian Ocean, which is, of course, such a huge percentage of the trip, mm -hmm. um, I was just so much further south, uh, north, sorry, than I really should have been. So I was getting a lot more um, headwinds and lighter winds as well. Right. But yeah. you're warmer and drier. Yeah, I was pretty happy about that. I, <laughs> I was totally okay with a little bit slower. <laughs> yeah, and well, if you're not in a hurry, right, you must have stay warm. Exactly. And so, just the severity of every storm that came past was just that. You could just see it. It was so blatant on the weather charts that, you know, if I was a couple of degrees further south, it would be, you know, 20 knots more, and that's not good. Yeah. So, okay. Well, Jess, it's been really, really great talking with you today. So thank you so much for, for travelling to, to the Queensland Cruise and Yacht Club to, so we could sit together, and thanks for, for, thanks for sharing your story on the Ocean Sailing Podcast and, and thanks for taking the time to talk to Andy as well. And I, I know he really would appreciate that and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure when he gets off, when he got the phone, he probably had uh, five more questions straight away for you. So, uh, I'm sure, yeah, no, no problem, it's been great. Okay, great, good luck with Dickie. Uh, it looks like a, a great, great business model, a great idea and it's, it's in a great, great looking website and a great service. So I encourage everybody to take advantage of Dickie, D-E-C-K-E-E.com, W.com. That's right. Um, and, and you'll find all sorts of uh, great help and advice and tips and stories and blog articles and reviews and it's a, it's a great looking website so good luck with that, that venture. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks Jess. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Email your comments and suggestions to david at oceansailingpodcast.com.au See you next week. sorry I want to look back I want to talk to them sometimes I wonder how they've lived a life like this before 
some are just so damn young So turn around and hear them speak So turn around and help them out Turn around cause you're watching them cry And watching some getting ready to die then knocked down to the ground and can't get back up Feelings are sad, I want to be mad Days here are like precious gold If you live another one, you have faith to carry on So turn around and hear them speak So turn around Turn around, cause you're watching them cry And watching some getting ready to die The memory of their courage is taped in my head It plays a soft one too I painted a picture Picture cold, dark sand and skies. I painted the future how it's supposed to be with warm sun in a bright town. So turn around and hear them speak. So turn around and help them out. Turn around, cause you're watching them. Watching some getting ready to die